The juice is loose from his mortal coil. O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. Many people in the audience are probably too young to remember when O.J. was constantly in the news. So for those who don't remember, O.J., of course, was best known for being the only player to rush for 2,000 yards in a 14-game season. That is what he was best known for until he murdered his wife and her friend and then was let off the hook in a criminal case but found liable for the murders in a civil case, a discrepancy that only occurred because racial tensions had been running high after LAPD officers had been acquitted after beating up a drunk-driving, wife-beating career criminal named Rodney King following a high-speed chase that reached 117 miles per hour, after which race riots broke out in LA, killing 63 people and injuring nearly 2,400 other people before the National Guard, the Army, and the Marines had to be called in to restore order. OJ's trial thrust his friend and sort of lawyer, Robert Kardashian, into the spotlight, which consequently foisted the rest of the Kardashian family onto America. Coverage of the trial got Norm MacDonald and Jim Downey booted off of Saturday Night Live, and the trial gave us the term N-word. That term really was not popular before the trial. It kind of invented the term, which is crazy. In a decade that saw the first impeachment trial of a U.S. president in 130 years, O.J.'s murder trial was still somehow the more significant and consequential trial. And our nation is still today grappling with its ultimate injustice. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. President Trump says that Jews who vote for Biden should have their head examined. We will get to that political analysis in a moment. First, though, we want to restore some balance to our country. We want to restore some balance to our bodies, and that's why you've got to check out Balance of Nature. Head on over to balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles. Balance of Nature, fruits and veggies, is the most convenient way to get whole fruits and vegetables daily. They use an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and vegetables into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in Balance of Nature's fruit and veggie capsules are fruits and veggies. Imagine trying to eat 31 different fruits and vegetables every day. That sounds miserable and time-consuming. With Balance of Nature, there has never been an easier way to ensure that you get your daily dose of fruits and veggies. Go to balanceofnature.com, use promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, to get 35% off your first set of fruits and veggies and an additional 10 bucks off every additional set you buy. That is balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, balanceofnature.com, promo code Knowles. The significance of the OJ trial pretty much cannot be overstated. It is one of my first public memories. It was just in the news all the time, and the news was on in my house all the time, and so I just remember O.J. Simpson was everywhere. And some people actually believed he was innocent, which is the craziest part. They found his blood at the scene, <laughs> okay? They, he, they ju- he just did it, okay? He just, he had a record of beating his wife and he just obviously did it. And then he later kind of admitted that he did it in a book and then he lost the, the civil trial. But there were still people who defended him. I remember Norm MacDonald, the late great Norm MacDonald, made a joke. It was, it was the best joke of all of the OJ jokes. And Norm had made about a billion OJ jokes because he and SNL writer Jim Downey had just pummeled OJ constantly in the 90s. And Don Olmeyer, who was an NBC executive who was, I think, OJ's best friend, was so angry about this that he fired the writer Jim Downey. And then Norm said that if Downey was gone, Norm was going to quit too. And so it lost Norm the main spot on Saturday Night Live. But of all the jokes, the best one came at... One of the, was it the ESPYs or I don't know, one of the sports awards, Norm was the MC, And here was his joke about the Heisman Trophy. And there's Charles Woodson. How about that? And what a season he had. (laughs) 
great, man. He, he became the first defensive player to win the Heisman Trophy. And congratulations, Charles. That is something that no one can ever take away from you. Unless you kill your wife and a waiter, in which case... <laughs> So you see in that scene, in just a cutaway to the audience reaction, it tells you everything you need to know about the OJ trial and the aftermath. There were five people pictured there, two white guys, three black guys, all athletes, one would imagine. And one black guy kind of puts his head in his hands. He's trying to muffle a laugh. Another black guy, is that Ken Griffey? Ken Griffey Jr.? Can't quite tell. I don't want to commit a racism by, by mixing someone up, but this is like 30 years ago. Uh, is there not laughing, shaking his head? Then the third black guy is laughing. Then you look right behind him. The one white guy, he's laughing. The second white guy to his left is just doesn't know how to react. He's not laughing. He, that, this, this summed it up. This summed it up. Why was this a racial trial? It was a racial trial because... OJ obviously did it. So the dream team of lawyers, which included Alan Dershowitz, which included Johnny Cochran, if the glove don't fit, you must acquit, which I guess included uh, Robert Kardashian. Though Robert Kardashian was, was part of OJ's dream team of lawyers in large part because he was a friend of OJ. He was going to let his, his law license lapse, actually. But by joining his legal team, he wouldn't have had to testify against OJ. And he hung around OJ and his murdered wife before she was gone uh, a fair bit and was aware of the tensions in their marriage. So he didn't want to testify against him. So he ends up, he ends up on the lawyer team. Then they realized the guy was guilty of sin. So the only way that they could possibly win was by making it a racial case and tying it to the Rodney King uh, beating, which was this, you know, career criminal who was beaten up by the LAPD. Uh, and, and it worked. It totally worked. In fact, one of the jurors from that case admitted it years later, said, yeah, we all we knew basically all of us that he was guilty, but this was kind of our revenge. Do you think that there are members of the jury that voted to acquit OJ because of Rodney King? Yes. You do? Yes. How many of you think felt that way? Oh, probably 90% of us. 90%? Did you feel that way? Yes. <laughs> that was payback. Uh huh. You think that's right? Wow, even she won't say that it's right, just puts her hands in the air. Because obviously it wasn't right. It's a great injustice. It was an injustice to this poor murdered woman. It was an injustice to her friend, Ron Goldman. It was, an, it was a, any miscarriage of justice undermines the, the broader system of justice. When, when the libs say, you know, uh, justice, no one, I forget their stupid slogan, but it's something to the effect of no one will have justice until everyone has justice. In a way, that's kind of true because justice is, is just uh, giving to people what they deserve. So, you know, if, if people are not getting what they deserve, it throws off the whole system in a body politic. And that is what happened here. And then the, the cynical playing of the race card set race relations way, way back. Uh, it, it created a lot of anti-cop fervor. Um, and it gave us this term, the N-word. It, it, it f f worsened race relations in as much as there was a rumor that the, uh, one of the cops, one of the detectives had said the N-word. He didn't say the N-word. He said the actual word, which you're no longer allowed to say because it's a, a term that's more taboo than, uh, you know, the, the ancient Israelites considered the holy name. And it, they were going to introduce this into evidence. And the uh, prosecutor, the, uh, the assistant DA and the judge both said, man, this is, a, a, this is a, a catastrophic potentially. This is the nastiest word in the English language. It's so loaded, there's no way that the trial is going to be conducted fairly if that word is introduced. And what's amazing is if you look at coverage of the case and the word before the, 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 this testimony was introduced, when, when the New York Times would write about the N-word, they would just write out the word. N I double G E R. You you truly because of this case, you actually can't say this word even in a clinical uh, reporting sense anymore in public. But but before you could, the New York Times would write this word all the time. After the case, they would never write it anymore. They would only write the euphemism, the N word. Totally 
shifted taboos on not just on race, but on cops, on justice, on criminals, on victims. So what do we do? We should pray for OJ. You should you know, pray for, for the soul of everyone who died. I guess we pray for his uh, victims too. And I pray for Norm, who never, you know, never got to, to see the final, the final, uh, I guess he knew how it was going to turn out anyway. But And there's a little bit of justice, which is that uh, O.J. Simpson can rest peacefully knowing that his wife's killer is now dead as well. Speaking of criminals, NBC News has decided to interview an expert uh, on, on crime. And that would be uh, Michael Avenatti. Michael Avenatti, remember, Tucker dubbed him the creepy porn lawyer. He represented... Uh, Stormy Daniels and defrauded her. That's why he's in prison right now. Uh, NBC News just days ago brought Michael Avenatti on for his very valuable expert analysis. Avenatti is both central to next week's trial and hard to reach now, even though he was, of course, a media fixture at the height of his work for Stormy Daniels. As Avenatti is a very newsworthy and legally relevant guest, He is speaking out for the first time from prison on the now historic case he helped ignite. Michael, welcome. Well, it's good to hear your voice, Ari. Uh, It's good to have you. We have a lot of news to get to. uh, But first, how are you holding up? (laughs) Well, as uh, as Elton John once wrote, I'm still standing, Ari. Okay, uh, enough of this. I don't need to hear any more uh, Michael Avenatti. Okay, I don't need to hear any more Michael Avenatti. And we're here. It's uh, Michael Good to have you. It's good to hear your voice, Ari. No, it's good. It's good for you to be here. How you doing, buddy? How you doing, degenerate fraud lawyer who ripped off a hooker? You, you psycho. Yeah, how you told? I'm holding up. All right. Well, we want to hear your expert legal analysis, you criminal. Uh, that is quite, quite the contrast to what we saw out of NBC just a couple of weeks ago when they were interviewing the former head of the Republican National Committee. We'll get to that in one second. First, though, I want to talk about preborn. Go to preborn.com slash Knowles. Did you know a baby's heart begins to beat at just three weeks? At five weeks, that heartbeat can be heard on ultrasound. This can sometimes be the baby's only defense in the womb. That's where Preborn steps in. Preborn rescues 200 babies every day from abortion simply by providing mothers with an ultrasound. After hearing her child's heartbeat and seeing its perfectly formed body in the womb, she's twice as likely to choose life. By six weeks, the baby's eyes are forming. By 10 weeks, a baby is able to suck his or her thumb. Preborn needs our help to save these precious lives. For just 28 bucks, you could be the difference between the life and death of a child. If you become a monthly sponsor, you will receive stories and ultrasound pictures of the lives you help save. All gifts are tax deductible, and 100% of your donation goes towards saving babies. To donate... Dial pound 250, say the keyword baby. That is pound 250, say the keyword baby, or go to preborn.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. I really, really support this group, and I encourage you to give whatever you can. Preborn.com slash Knowles. You know, he's a man of many impressive titles. My new yes or no episode with former presidential candidate, former U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, world-renowned neurosurgeon, Dr. Secretary Ben Carson is available now. Check out this little teaser. We don't know how the brain works. We we haven't mapped the whole thing. Take your index finger and touch that card right there. Now, I know what it took for you to do that. The sound waves had to leave my lips, travel to the air, and then your external alternators travel down to your tympanic membrane instead of a vibratory force, which traveled across the oscillators of the middle ear to the oval and round with the seventh vibratory force. Distorted the microcilia, converting mechanical energy to electrical energy, which traveled across the cochlear nerve to the cochlear nucleus at the pontomedullary junction, from there to the superior olivary nucleus, coming down the cortical spinal tract across the internal capsule, into the cerebral pedal, and extending down to the cervical medullary decussation into the spinal cord, brain matter, synapse, in there, stimulating the nerve and the muscle so you could point to that card. You took the words right out of my mouth. (laughs) 
You can get early access to this episode for free. All you have to do is create a free Daily Wire Plus account at dailywire.com. And if you are already a Daily Wire Plus member, you can watch the full uncensored episode ad-free exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. So if you are a degenerate criminal lawyer, I'm not saying like you defend criminals. I mean, you're a criminal yourself. If you rip off hookers, if you go on TV, whore yourself out to every single TV channel, uh, state a bunch of bogus nonsense for years about the president, none of which ever comes to fruition, and then get pinched for, for being a fraud and end up wearing an orange jumpsuit, you will be welcomed onto NBC News with open arms. Please, sir, give us your legal analysis. However, if you run one of the two major political parties in the United States, but that party happens to be the Republican Party, this is how you will be greeted on NBC News. The fact that Ms. McDaniel is on the payroll at NBC News. To me, that is inexplicable. I have some thoughts about Ronna McDaniel and the normalization of the dangerous damned lies from the Republican Party. She is a co-conspirator and an enabler. An anti-democracy election denier. She lied to the American people to further the autocratic movement that is Trumpism. She dropped the Romney from her name, apparently, because Donald Trump hates Mitt Romney. How does that feel to change your name to curry favor with a madman. We weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it. And I, and I hope they will reverse their decision. We hope NBC will reconsider its decision. Because if we have to interview the perfectly anodyne head of uh, one of the two major political parties, uh, we won't be able to interview that degenerate criminal from prison anymore, Michael Avenatti. You see, you see Ronna McDaniel in her role articulating Republican policies and priorities. She is a liar. How is she a liar? I don't, well, I don't know. I'm not going to point to any examples of lies. But we can't have liars on this network. Turning now to Michael Avenatti. <laughs> are you, are you kidding me? They're not kidding. They obviously don't care about the distinction between lies and the truth. They obviously uh, don't care about credibility when it comes to their experts on the network. They care about one thing. Are you on the team or are you not on the team? All, all this talk, put Rana aside for a second, all this talk about Donald Trump being a criminal. He has 90 plus felonies. He could go to prison for 700 years. He's a criminal threat to our system. They don't care. They love their criminals. They exalt all their criminals. Bill Clinton perjured himself, lost his law license. He wasn't convicted in his impeachment trial, going back to uh, that aforementioned trial. But all these sorts of criminals, up to and including Michael Avenatti, no big deal. But those criminals are on their team. And Donald Trump, who has not been convicted of any crimes, he's the, they're prosecuting him on four different fronts and they're levying all sorts of ridiculous civil judgments against him to try to bankrupt him so that he can't run for president again in 2024. That guy and anyone even remotely associated with him, including a member of the Romney family who was running the RNC, Ron and McDaniel, uh, they're, they're out. They have to be totally ostracized. Now, speaking of the law, Curious little news story just came out of Ohio. Joe Biden might not be on the ballot in Ohio. Ohio has trended pretty Republican in recent years, though there was an expression for a long time in American politics, as goes Ohio, so goes the nation, that Ohio actually was up for grabs. Uh, Joe Biden might not be on the ballot there. According to for Frank LaRose, Ohio Secretary of State, uh, the DNC, the Democratic National Convention, will occur after the Ohio state deadline to certify candidates. Meaning, if they pick their nominee after that deadline, their nominee might not make it to the ballot. So LaRose, the Secretary of State, sends this letter to Democrats saying, hey guys, you got to fix this because I'm just giving you a fair warning. You obviously have your nominee. I don't think it's going to be nominee Marianne Williamson. Well, just to let you know, you got to follow the law, and right now your Democratic National Convention is out of compliance with Ohio state law. It's not just Ohio, Alabama too, although Joe Biden will never win Alabama. There's not even a chance of that happening, so it matters a little bit less. But Biden could be off the ballot in Alabama too, according to the election chief in that state, because the state certification deadline comes several days before the DNC. Uh, so the Biden campaign has responded to this, 
And they've said, pish posh, no big deal. They've dismissed it out of hand. They say state officials have the ability to grant provisional ballot access certification prior to the conclusion of presidential nominating conventions. In 2020 alone, states like Alabama, Illinois, Montana, and Washington all allowed provisional certification for Democratic and Republican nominees. Okay, so they're saying, look, whatever, the law is the law, but you guys can brush aside the law in cases like this, so that's what you should do here. Okay, but I think we got a Republican Secretary of State in Ohio, don't we? Yeah, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Democrats have been trying to kick Donald Trump off the ballot for way more preposterous reasons in a number of different states. Here, we have a a perfectly justifiable legal reason why Biden might not make it to the ballot. Why would we just give it to him? Can you explain to me why we would just give it to him? The, The Democrats are doing every single thing they can to subvert this election. They are prosecuting Donald Trump, the, the Republican nominee, the former president and leader of the party ever since he was the former president, on four different fronts. They're then levying civil judgments against him to bankrupt him so he can't run for president. They're then trying to kick him off the ballot in multiple states all around the country because they're so afraid that if he's on the ballot, people are going to vote for him. They're so afraid that if he's got a dollar to his name and he's not wearing an orange jumpsuit, people are going to elect this guy. They're doing everything they can to subvert our constitutional order to keep the man off the ballot. And then the Biden campaign says, hey, by the way, can we have a freebie in Ohio? You'll let it, you'll, you'll give us a freebie, right? You'll put us on the ballot, even though legally we don't meet the requirements, right? Republicans are just supposed to say, oh, yes, of course. Of course we'll do you that favor. Oh, that's just, you know, that, that's in keeping with the norms and standards. What norms and standards? Democrats have blown up the norms and standards. If you asked me two years ago, I guess I would have said, yeah, okay, that's fine. Sure, why not? Whatever. So put them on the ballot. When we had different norms and standards, the Democrats chose to blow that up. You can't just allow that to occur without any consequences to them. That creates a very perverse incentive for the Democrats to continue to undermine our electoral process. All I'll say, I'm not going to give any particular specific prescriptions. Democrats should squeeze this Ohio issue for all it's worth. That's what, or rather the Republicans should squeeze the Democrats on this Ohio issue for all that it is worth. Now, speaking of maximizing votes, President Trump has a view of the Jews in America who even today are voting for Joe Biden. Biden has totally lost control of the Israel situation. He has abandoned Israel. He's totally abandoned Israel. And frankly, you know, he's a low IQ individual. He has no idea where he is and who he's supporting. He doesn't know if he's supporting the Palestinians, but he knows one thing. He is not supporting Israel. He has abandoned Israel. And any Jewish person that votes for a Democrat or votes for Biden should have their head examined. Yeah, fair enough. That's fine by me. The comparison here will be with Joe Biden's quote, which is, if you're black and you're not voting for me, you ain't black. But it's actually a little bit of a different statement. Joe Biden is saying that black identity is contingent upon voting for Democrats, that you lose your racial identity if you are, are black, but you vote for a Republican, which is much less true and much more offensive than what Trump said here about Jews. Trump just said, hey, I'm good for the Jews. Biden's bad for the Jews. If you're a Jew and you're voting for Joe Biden, who hates the Jews, and it specifically hates the Jewish state, apparently, uh, you're crazy. You should have your head examined. That is not quite as offensive And it's probably true. (laughs) Joe Biden is the guy who's leading the party where they're marching with the Palestinian flags in support of Hamas against the Jews, river to the sea, wipe out all the Jews, Palestine will be free. That's, That's Biden's party. And so Trump's saying, look, they have a town named after me in Israel. Okay, I got the Abraham Accords. I'm a great defender of the Jewish state and Bibi Netanyahu loves me. Okay, if you're a Jew and you're still voting for that guy, you're out of your mind. And that statement, It's not only semantically not the same thing as what uh, Joe Biden said about black people, but it's also uh, probably true. Also probably true these days. Now, speaking of major political issues that affect everybody in America, this is kind of a weak generic transition. You got to check out Pivotal Debt Solutions. Go to zapmydebt.com. Does your debt keep you tossing and turning at night? 
It's like you can't get away from it. The unfortunate reality is that our banking system is designed to trap you in debt. These insanely high interest credit cards and loans make it nearly impossible to pay off your debt. Thankfully, there's a new way out of the debt trap with Pivotal Debt Solutions. Pivotal Debt Solutions is not like the old school debt relief companies that string your debt out for years. They have new aggressive strategies to end your debt faster and easier than you thought possible. Pivotal Debt Solutions can cut or even eliminate interest. They will help find programs to write off your balances so that you owe less. They can stop those threatening phone calls. The bottom line is that Pivotal Debt Solutions will find every solution possible to end your debt permanently. Before you do anything, contact Pivotal Debt Solutions at zapmydebt.com. Talk to them for free and find out how fast they can help you get out of debt. That is zapmydebt.com. My favorite comment yesterday is from David Winokur2131, who says the UK wants to ban smartphones for minors. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. I didn't say that right. Hold on. Can you go, can you go back to that comment? I didn't say that right. Because I've never heard that aphorism before, and I, I conclude that it must be a British idiom. The UK wants to ban smartphones for minors there, Governor. Yeah, yeah. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut every once in a while. I don't know why I went straight to Michael Caine for that, but I like that. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. Okay, speaking of the Jews and U.S. government policy, uh, the U.S. position, the Biden administration position on Israel is becoming clearer and clearer. It has to become clearer because the war is really coming to a head. Is this war going to end? Is it going to launch into a brand new wave of offensives? What is the U.S. going to do about it since the U.S. is the defender of the state of Israel and we fund a lot of the Israeli military and we're the global hegemon? What is the position? Biden's caught between a rock and a hard place because Biden's establishment class, his, his donor class, supports the state of Israel broadly. The Democratic base hates the state of Israel, and supports Palestine liberation and Hamas broadly. So what's he going to do? Is he going to side with the, the establishment and the donors, or is he going to side with the wackos in the street? According to John Kirby, the national security spokesman for the president, they're going to take a little bit of a tougher line against the state of Israel. Now, Kirby was asked if, if the, we're not applying a double standard here to the state of Israel. Are we not blaming the state of Israel for doing things that we ourselves do in the United States with impunity. So there were seven children that were killed by that mm -hmm. U.S. Hellfire missile. Yeah. No accountability, you said, um, was part of the plan. So why is this so different than what, what we did there? Well, look, we're th these are events that happened three years apart, two different uh, geographic locations, two different countries, two different sets of circumstances, two different types of threat that were being evaluated, and completely two different militaries that were involved with two different chains of command. So uh, I think we got to be careful comparing both events too closely. We, too, had an independent investigation, Martha, of that incident. Um, and that independent investigator uh, found that there was no need for personal accountability to be had, but did find that the U.S. military needed to make some systemic changes, procedural changes in how we looked at intelligence and acted on that intelligence. The Israelis, similarly, have said the same thing about this event uh, this week with the with the WCK strike that they're going to make some systemic changes. Now we're uh, we're we're glad to hear that, and we're going to be watching to see uh, what those changes are and how they can put them into effect. But these are two different uh, events. They're not I, that I, different, though, John. <laughs> Love Martha McCallum here, uh, John. They're actually not that different. The 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 comparison she's making here, she says, okay, the U.S. Uh, you know, a Hellfire missile strike killed seven kids. It was a bad strike. It was a dumb strike. It, it killed innocent people, not even as collateral damage. They just, I mean, it was technically collateral damage in that they, we killed civilians in a, in a war scenario, but it was just a, it was just a bad strike. And the Israelis killed a bunch of aid, aid workers in a bad strike. So why is it the worst thing in the world when they do it, but it's really sort of fine when we do it? And Kirby says, oh, it's totally different. To it's totally different here, you see, because there's different wars, there's different countries, there's different this, there's different that. And what he's, what he's trying to express, but trying to avoid saying explicitly, is it's different because we're America and they're Israel. 
It's different because they're this country in the Middle East that's a tiny little country that is totally dependent on us for its very existence. And so we get to call the shots and they're not playing ball with us anymore. And we're America, we're the global hegemon and we do whatever the hell we want. <laughs> That's, that's basically what he's saying, but but it doesn't sound good when it comes out that way. So so that's his argument. I I make these observations, by the way, as someone who I think has been pretty fair on the Israel Palestine conflict. I mean, there's some people on the left and even on the right who are basically you know growing out long beards and marching with the pro Hamas people in the street. I'm certainly not that. There are also some people who say that the state of Israel can do no wrong and they have impunity to just you know level any any neighborhoods they want. I also do not agree with that. I think that in war, one has to uh, consider the principles that justify war, both in going to war and in conducting a war. And I think most people generally agree that Israel was justified in going to war in Gaza after the attack on October 7th of last year. But there is a perfectly uh, open debate over whether or not the state of Israel is still justified in war, and in in the conduct of the war. And in fact, I've raised... Uh, some fairly pointed questions about that, given the uh, decreasing likelihood that Israel will be able to achieve its ultimate war aim, which is to oust Hamas in Gaza. And uh, also, given that, if there is no reasonable probability of success, then the justification by proportionality disappears for the state of Israel. So it's not like I'm, I'm you know, saying the the pro-Palestinian side has absolutely no gripes whatsoever. It's not as though I'm saying there shouldn't be some winding down of this war. But it is simply an inescapable fact. The Biden administration is against the state of Israel right now. And I think has become unfairly against the state of Israel. And I think the Biden administration is walking that tightrope. Had, had this war taken place two years ago, I think the Biden administration would probably be much more more pro-Israel, but they're afraid that their base right now is totally anti-Israel and their base is totally in favor of pro-Palestine liberation. And Joe Biden doesn't want to lose those votes. So he's more willing to irritate some of the donors in the establishment class than he is to irritate uh, the base. And so Donald Trump comes out and he says, look, I'm the pro-Israel candidate. And there are going to be people on the right who are not pro-Israel, especially now as this war drags on for six months. Uh, public opinion of the state of Israel and public support for this war is diminishing. That's just what happens in times of war. Don't don't forget what happened during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, how quickly support for the American position in that war diminished, even here in the United States. Uh, so that that's going to happen. It's a little bit of a gamble for Trump too. But but the I think that the two parties have made it clear. If you're pro-Israel, you vote for Trump. If you're anti-Israel, pro-Palestine liberation, whatever, you vote for Joe Biden. Now, Speaking of that war and foreign affairs and whether it's going to end or heat up, I said on the show, I think it was last week, I said, look, the war basically has to wind down. It has to come to an end. If, if the Israeli intelligence leaks are to be, uh, to be believed, if it is the case that they no longer believe that they can oust Hamas in Gaza, and even if they predicate that on the loss of U.S. support and the U.S. loss of U.S. support is real, then the war just has to end. There's no way for it to continue. Days later, Bibi Netanyahu calls my bluff, or calls the, the bluff of a, of a lot of analysts in the state of Israel and in the United States and elsewhere in the world, and says, no, we are going into Rafah, this last stronghold of Hamas in southern Gaza. We are going in. We have set a date for the invasion. It is happening. Over the objections of the Biden administration, over the objections of the international community, over the objections of apparently even some of the uh, Israeli intelligence analysts who are saying that it's not actually going to do anything. It's not, it's not, it's not going to work. Does that mean it's really going to happen? I don't know. It, it certainly means that this is one of Bibi Netanyahu's only two choices. This, this is coming to a head. He either has to wind down the whole war and he had started to move troops out of Gaza so it seemed to signal that he was just going to retreat and wind down the war, or he's just got to go full bore very quickly and risk international and American condemnation. But but Bibi Netanyahu's caught between a rock and a hard place too, just as Joe Biden is. There, there were thousands and thousands of people demonstrating in Tel Aviv against his government just days ago and his conduct of the war. Plus, he's using support of his biggest state sponsor, the United States, which funds 6.5% of the Israeli military. Will, it, will the invasion actually take place? 
I, if I were in his shoes, I don't know what I would do. He is in a virtually impossible position. He, he can either end the war, he can either go into Rafa. The one thing that probably cannot continue is the status quo of, of this war, of just the kind of constant, slow, dragging this out. At a certain point, especially in an American election year, there's going to be a lot, of, a lot more pressure, even than there currently is on Bibi Netanyahu, to, to pick a strategy and roll with it. Now, speaking of a tough political environment for national leaders, on the domestic front, all of this might be immaterial. The, the war in the Middle East, the war in Ukraine, frankly, even the immigration crisis might become less significant because inflation is back. Inflation is really, really bad right now. The uh, price of rent and other shelter costs ha- has jumped more than 5% since March of last year. Uh, rent of primary residence up five, over 5.5%. Uh, owner's equivalent rent up almost 6%, water and sewer maintenance up over 5%, garbage and trash collection almost 6%, electricity over 5%, repair of household items up 18%, homeowners and renters insurance up over 4.5%. It's so bad, even CNN is admitting that the inflation problem is brutal. Poor inflation, which is a better indicator of sort of what's happening with underlying inflation, Mm -hmm. uh, that also picked up. So taking a look at some of the categories we saw in the month of March that continue to increase. So gas prices, that was a pretty big contributor here, right? It was really gas and shelter, I should say, that contributed to uh, more than half of the shelter can, I mean, has shelter gone down at all? I mean, I can't even remember a month where it's actually gone, gone we've seen a it, decrease, it, right? It's a really important point. It hasn't. And so we had been hoping, actually, because if it, you think about shelter, if you think about rents, for example, mm-hmm. 12-month leases, we were hoping that this was a lagging indicator, that we would actually start to get some progress yeah. with shelter, uh, but that didn't, that didn't happen. But that didn't happen, did it, Joe Biden? It didn't happen. And, and so all of these extraneous political issues uh, probably are going to diminish in their importance because when everybody knows when they go to the grocery store how expensive milk is, everybody knows when they write that rent check or when they fill out their bills, you know, for household repairs and maintenance and just all the ordinary stuff of life, they can see if that's getting a little better or if that's getting a little worse. And bad news for Biden, good news for the conservatives is it's getting a lot worse. Uh, Now, it's going to be bad news for the conservatives if it doesn't lead to any kind of political change. Then it's going to be especially bad for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, the verdict is in. The new courtroom comedy series, judged by Matt Walsh on Daily Wire Plus, is a hit. If you missed the Tuesday night premiere, now's the time to catch up on all the laughter and legal antics. Watch and witness Matt Walsh in the role he was born to play as the judge who's here to settle real grievances from real litigants. And believe it or not, his decisions are actually legally binding. From the bizarre case of exploding lips to the outrageous story of a stolen car, Judged by Matt Walsh delivers a weekly dose of reality petty court that will have you laughing out loud. Episodes one and two are streaming now on Daily Wire Plus with new episodes released every Tuesday featuring new cases, plaintiffs, and of course, Matt Walsh with a robe and gavel. This is the Can't Miss series of 2024. If you are not a Daily Wire Plus member yet, Join now and use code JUDGED at checkout for 35% off your membership at dailywareplus.com. Finally, finally, we've arrived at my favorite time of the week when I get to hear from you in the mailbag. Our mailbag is sponsored by Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. Right now, our listeners can get an additional 50, 50% off their first month. That is puretalk.com slash Knowles. Take it away. Hello, Michael. Dorian from Portland, Oregon here. 50 years young and a card-carrying member of Generation X. So, if I ever hit you with any classic Generation X sarcasm, deal with it. Anyway, I know your feelings on IVF and surrogacy, but where do you stand on adoption, given the fact that newborn babies outnumber childless couples by roughly 36 to 1? I can see that as a viable alternative to IVF, and also an alternative to abortion for unplanned pregnancies. Hope to hear from you. Thanks so much. Great question. Obviously, very in favor of adoption. And you've raised an important aspect of why the surrogacy industry and IVF generally are so disordered and have so many uh, unfortunate consequences. One of the consequences of the promotion of the surrogacy industry and IVF is that adoption will go away. 
and, and babies who are available to be adopted won't find homes because people are going to go spend $100,000 and make their own kid in a test tube, or a couple of men are going to go purchase an egg and rent out a womb and, and make their own designer baby rather than adopt someone else's baby who is in need. What is the difference here? I've, I've said that my uh, opposition to the surrogacy industry in IVF comes from the fact that uh, the only person who can legitimately be said to have rights in, in the matter of procreation is the child who has a right to be born of the specific conjugal act of his mother and father who are together in holy matrimony. Uh, What does that mean for something like adoption? It means that adoption helps to rectify an injustice. Adoption helps to rectify a social problem. Children born out of wedlock in bad circumstances with parents who are not able to, to care for them. And even that, by the way, the, the mother's going, going through and having the baby and not killing the baby, say, through abortion. That is a wonderful and laudable thing. But some of those mothers are not able then to take care of the baby themselves. And then adoption comes in and helps to rectify that problem. And it, it results in an abundance of grace. And it's just a, a, a wonderful and a charitable way to help rectify social problems in this fallen world. IVF and the surrogacy industry totally gut that. And they they turn it. They say, no, actually, the baby doesn't really have any rights. Babies are just objects to be bought and sold on a market. Go to the baby store. You design your baby. Then most of the babies you create, you just kind of leave in a freezer or you kill them through abortion. And then, But you pick up one or two and then you you use those. And then you maybe I want one boy and one girl and the others, you know, it's too bad. And then you, you give birth to this baby or you, you know, purchase a, a mother's egg and you intentionally deprive that child of his natural mother and you sell the baby to a couple of men or a couple of women or a single mother or whatever it is, even a single father maybe. Uh, it's totally inverts it. And it says that all the rights are on the side of the the would-be parents. It's the adults here who have a right to a child, the right to own a child, to possess a child, to do with a child as they please according to their own whims and fancies, rather than the right of a child, a right that comes from nature to be the product of his mother's and father's specific conjugal act, a right that that comes from our very human nature. Uh, Really, really... Uh, ugly inversion, and you've drawn a great deal of attention to one of the one of the many unfortunate consequences. Okay, next question. Hey, Michael, my name is Dylan Wagner. I had something of a multi-part question, but first I want to thank you for everything you do. You are willing to address the principles at the heart of problems, which is often the most controversial aspect. Further, you are the most philosophically educated and consistent host on The Daily Wire, and finally, I, you have greatly contributed to my conversion to Catholicism, and you are certainly one of the people I must thank for getting me to confirmation on Easter Vigil just a few weeks ago. Put a pause there. We put a now pause on in the my question. actual questions. I'm not that handsome. Come on, get out of here. Stop it. Sorry, I just all those lovely compliments. I had to jump in and stop it. I'm not that. Come on, I'm not. My jawline's not that chiseled. Okay, sorry. Go on. I was wondering what your opinion of monarchy is. I find myself increasingly seeing it as a viable or even ideal form of government. Forgive me for that voice crack. Um, Do you hold either of these views? If you see monarchy as a viable form of government, what kind of monarchy do you find to be the best option? Elective or appointed monarchies or hereditary monarchies? Absolute governments and semi-absolute governments limited or something else? Is there a monarchical government in history you find to be the closest to the ideal? Finally, what political philosophers do you recommend? Do you recommend Edmund Burke or Joseph de Maistre or Plato or Aristotle or Augustine or Aquinas or someone else? Again, thank you for everything you do and have a blessed day. Marvelous question. Uh, recommend all of the above with those political philosophers. They're, they're all terrific. And then one who I mention a fair bit and who is often not thought of as a political philosopher, but who has a lot to say specifically on the question of monarchy is Dante who writes a book called Monarchy, which is really great and worth reading. Uh, You ask, is monarchy a viable form of government? The answer to that is obviously yes. Many, if not most, governments throughout history have been monarchies. It's one of the three main forms of government that could be considered a, a, a good form of government. The other two being aristocracy and democracy. Now, 
Uh, as I've mentioned on the show before, in Polybius's view of these three types of regime, they, they have their kind of dark version too. So the dark version of monarchy is tyranny. The dark version of aristocracy is oligarchy. And the dark version of democracy is mob rule. And the reason I bring up Polybius here, I mean, Dante has a lot to say about monarchy and the specific advantages of monarchy. And you ask for a, a good example of a monarch. Probably a Christian would say the best example of monarchy in history is under the reign of Caesar Augustus. And the evidence of this is that that is the fullness of time in which our Lord chooses to become incarnate. And this gives us the, the broad peace of the Pax Romana, when for all intents and purposes, the Romans had conquered the world. Uh, so uh, enough there about monarchy in particular. Pulling back to Polybius, the, the importance for people who are really averse to monarchy or really averse to aristocracy or even people who are very averse to democracy. In fact, our founding fathers had a, a lot of skepticism of democracy. Something to remember about Polybius's view is that he understood there to be a cycle of regimes. So, uh, you know, you might say, well, I prefer democracy to monarchy or to aristocracy. Okay, well, what happens when, you're, when your democracy decays? What happens then? I mean, don't forget to use the example of Caesar the Roman Republic had become so deeply corrupt that Julius Caesar was the hero. The people loved Julius Caesar. He he was the, the, the virtuous figure compared to the extremely corrupt people who were running the Roman Republic. In, in modernity, we, we've kind of changed the story here, and we, we pretend that, you know, Caesar was sort of a villain, but he, he really wasn't. You think Caesar was bad, just wait until you hear about who was running the Republic. It was really, really nasty. So th this is the problem. And a lot of people are, are beginning to worry that this is set in a little bit in America, that republics, democracies can, can be really beautiful and wonderful things, but if they become corrupted and they turn away from the common good and only focus on self-interest, then they just naturally can kind of decay into an oligarchy. Many people describe the American form of government today as an oligarchy or into a kind of form of tyranny, uh, and at the very least into a, a form of uh, a self-interested factionalism, which, which means that necessarily it's going to change into something else because no political uh, regime is eternal in, in this fallen world. Next one. Hey, Michael. In listening to the show last week, I was intrigued when you spoke about the petty narcissism of small differences. As a conservative journalist who does not openly discuss his political leanings because it is immaterial to my job as a sports reporter— I've not had to deal with any lady ballers yet. I have recently run afoul of a fringe right-wing group who does police audits online. I earned myself an attempted smear campaign on X by critiquing their disrespectful treatment of police officers. My question is, how do we offer honest critiques of those we share only small differences without looking like we are a part of the other side of the debate? Thank you for taking my question. You, you just have to focus on the issue. Don't focus on the people. One of the... the most insidious temptations of the petty narcissism of small differences is that that you uh, are really just focusing on the other person because the other person is a threat to your position and to your influence. So it becomes very, very personal. And you should try to avoid that. I mean, this uh, our friend, our old friend Rene Girard would have a lot to say about this in the in the theory of mimesis and how we imitate one another in our in our actions and our speech and our desires even, and that this creates a, 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 an emerging and building hostility until there's a war of all against all, and, and we need to find a scapegoat to to cast that kind of tension out of the political community. So one way to try to mitigate that is to focus not on the person but on the issue. If, if a, a person has a slightly different take on, on a policy than you do, focus on the difference. You know, focus, Don't focus on the self, which is where the petty narcissism comes in, but focus actually on the small difference and try to get precise about it. It probably won't work and you'll probably just end up you know, slugging it out with one another, but that, that would be the, the best strategy to avoid it. The rest of the show continues now. It's Fake Headline Friday, baby. We have one more I think one or two more voice mailbag questions. Then we have more written mailbag questions. Then I need your help through the iPad to discern which is the fake headline. So much more to do. Head on over to dailywire.com. Become a member. Use code Knowles, Canada, WLAS, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans.